Good morning. Hey, there's seven of you that beat me. Good morning. Welcome. I'm putting a water bottle in my pocket just in case I need a water bottle. How are you today? Welcome. Hey, if you're catching this at some random time, just want to remind you that we do a live stream Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 8 o'clock, about a half an hour, most weekdays, uh, unless we don't, but most weekdays we do. Um, so I just want to invite you to look us up, join with us live anytime. Welcome. Good morning, Jeffrey. Oh, weather is getting good. So good to hear. Uh, it has been nice out here. So um, Connor, good morning. Lori, good morning. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 14 today. Uh, thank you for getting up with me with your Bibles in hand. Good morning, Shannon. We're just going to wait for a few minutes while some people find us. Uh, thank you for those who found me before I started. Uh, there were seven of you. Um, anyway, hope things are good. Hope you had a good weekend. Uh, life is still weird. Coronavirus season is still going on. Uh, hopefully some things are changing for the better, getting back to normal a little bit. Good morning, Rachel. Uh, Eric, good morning. Happy Monday. Back at it. All right, it's kind of kind of just chilling in my office, Oop, kicking the tripod. Uh, I've been standing lately. I like standing when I do this. It's, it's, uh, I feel like I get a little bit of energy. I'm going to need a little bit of energy today. A lot of names, a lot of kind of weird stuff that we're looking at today in Genesis. So hopefully uh, you are ready and attentive and uh, fresh, ready to go to dive in and to dig in. All right, um, trying to think if there's anything else going on. Uh, did you guys, did you guys all watch the church service yesterday? We had a couple going on in our house. We had our church, and then my son was watching uh, Elevation Church at night. That was fun. They, they're wild and rowdy and uh, rock stars. Um, anyway, let's let's grab Bibles. If you got a Bible, let's go to Genesis chapter fourteen. We're gonna read through it, see what it has to say, how it challenges us, how it speaks to us. Good morning, John. Welcome. Um, also, uh, we're not on Facebook anymore since we're, we've moved over to YouTube. So, um, if you want to share this, feel free to share it. Uh, oh, awesome. Jennifer, so good to hear. Um, if you want to share it on your Facebook page, go ahead and do that. That'll help people find us since we've transitioned over here. And some people have had a little bit of a difficult time getting over here. So let's pray and jump in. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for another week, another another Monday morning that we get to come together. We get to open your word. We get to hear what you would say. We pray that you would bless this moment, that you would speak to us through this word. Um, have your way in this time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here we go. Uh, Genesis chapter 14, we've been walking through the story of Abraham. He's the father of the Jewish uh, nation. He is also the nation of Israel. He is also the father of faith. Uh, he, he's a man who walked by faith. He's known for walking by faith. He made some mistakes. We're going to see, and we have seen some of those mistakes. Uh, so he wasn't a perfect man, but he was a man of faith, and he walked after God as faithfully as he knew how. Uh, and so we have we have seen the division that he has had with his nephew Lot. Uh, remember that Lot and Abraham uh, got they were so blessed that they multiplied on the land so much that they needed to the to divide because their flocks and their herdsmen were competing with one another. Good morning, Brad. Uh, so their flocks and their herdsmen were competing with one another. So Abram came to Lot and said, hey, man, you pick where you go and I'll just go wherever you don't. And so Lot looked up and he, he picked for himself the best land. And he picked the land that was towards the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, leaving the, the rest to Abraham and so, or to Abram. Uh, Abram, Abraham, same guy, different times in his life. He was called by different names. So Lot pitches his tent towards Sodom, and that turns out in every way to have been a bad decision. He thought he was getting the better deal. He thought he was, he was, he was, uh, he was out to, to, to serve himself, to give himself the best possible advantage, and yet it turned out to be uh, in every way bad for him and a bad decision. 
as where Abram was blessed all the more taking the lesser. Uh, maybe there's a, a massive lesson in that, that, that as we think that we're just, hey, you know what, I, I got to do what's right for me. You know, I got to do what's best for me. And that's, your, and that's your, your, your focal point. And that's your argument for what you do. Like Lot, I got to do what's best for me. I think you're going to find that that what's best for me attitude will actually oftentimes cause a lot of problems. It will not actually serve you in the long run as where Abram, where he considered Lot better than himself, elevated Lot and just said, hey man, you just do what's best for you. Abram was the one to be blessed as a result. As we are those that are seeking our own, seeking our own blessing, seeking our own, uh, it's all about me, we will find that we will struggle more, we will suffer more than if we are all about the other, reaching out to the other, serving the other, blessing the other, we will find that as we lift others up, we will go up, but as we lift ourselves up, we will go down. It is an amazing principle. I think it works completely and every time. Uh, and so Lot has found that out. He thought he was choosing what was good for him, and as a result, uh, it caused suffering. So here we go. So then we get to chapter 14 and, and we got a lot of names of a lot of kings. Now, what we're going to look at here is what was going on in this land. Remember, Abram and Lot uh, in, their, in their families, they moved in to a place that was inhabited by a bunch of people groups. There was a lot going on. There were, there were Canaanites, there were uh, Hittites, Parasites, all these different ites of people, types of people that were in the land, uh, many different wicked kind of nations doing really evil stuff, uh, lots of di different kingdoms going on in the land when Abram got there. So uh, obviously there was the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. There were, there were these cities that had wicked kings and wicked practices. So what we're going to see here in chapter 14 is kind of some of the conflict that was happening in this land uh, already uh, opposed to what Abraham was doing. So chapter 14, verse 1, in the days of uh, Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Shadorlamor, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, these kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Admath, uh, Shemember, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoor. And all these joined forces in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Shadorlamor, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Shadorlamor and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Raphaim in Ashtoroth Kanaim, <laughs> the Z Zuzim in Ham, and Imim in Shevela. Oh, this is the best one so far. Shevekeriathim. <laughs> I have no idea. You to say that one time fast. Uh, and the Horites in their hill country of Sheer in, in far, as far as El Pen Peran, on the border of the wilderness, and they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in the Hazazon Tamar. You guys got all that? So here's what we had. We had, there was 12 years where Shadolomor was, 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 uh, was reigning. There were, everybody else was serving him. And then in the 13th year, there was a rebellion. Uh, and so it basically created a war. Uh, certain kingdoms took one side, other kingdoms took the other side. And there was a big battle that was going on. Uh, remember now, now part of this battle, Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah got caught up in this. Now this, this was this, this conflict that was going on, Middle Eastern conflict that was going on thousands of years ago between all of these different people groups in the area. The reason why that story is here is because the people of God got dragged into this battle. And the reason why they got dragged into the battle is basically because of where Lot set up camp, because he decided he was going to become one of the people of Sodom. He was going to kind of move into town in, in these cities. 
where all this was going on, which kind of made it this situation that, that Abram is going to get involved in. Otherwise, it probably would have just passed right through and we would not have seen this, this complicated story with all these names and people groups that we know very little about. Uh, and so uh, it, it gives us a little bit of context of what was going on there. But the, the big deal is that Lot has found himself in the middle of a war zone in this time. He, he's found himself as, as he thought he was going, <laughs> tough names, thank you, Kathy, for, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it's hard to read some of this. Um, but uh, but Lot, Lot thought he was doing what was best for him, and so he moved to a place that wasn't good for him, and it was not good for his family. Uh, it, it, he put himself in harm's way. He put himself in a in a place that, sure, it looked like, you know what, they got, they got schools there, they got shopping malls, they got everything going for them, but, it, but at the same time, they had conflict, and he put his family in a place where there was great conflict going on already, and he got caught up in the middle of it. Principle, perhaps, being when we're making decisions about where we're going to end up and where we're going to land, uh, are we thinking about the bigger picture? Are we thinking about the spiritual consequences? Are we thinking about, uh, or, or are we just simply thinking about, hey, there's a job opening? Is that how we're thinking about it when we're moving? Hey, this is a, this is a land of prosperity, a land of opportunity, but we don't pay any attention to the long-term effects, right? Um, there's story after story of people, maybe some of you have it on here as well, that, that sometimes you move based on a, a decision, not a spiritual decision, not God's leading you to do a work in a certain place, but you just make a financial decision. And that's the whole thing. And you move to a, a community, you move to a town that actually can harm your family. It actually creates a certain kind of tension and, and, and battlefield that you weren't previously fighting and that you really, it was needless that you would fight it in the first place, but you move there thinking, hey, this is going to be good for my family, and it turns out to be bad for your family. So as you are making your decisions, as I'm making my decisions about what I'm going to do in my life, where I'm going to go in my life, I want to be prayerful. I want to bring it before the Lord, and I want to make my decisions not only for what's good uh, financially and, and career-wise, but also what is, what is spiritually going to help uh, my family. So tracking, that's what happened so far. Then verse Eight. Then the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adam and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, that is Zor, went out and they joined battle in the valley of Siddim with Shadorlamor, king of Elam, king of Tidal, king of Goyim, uh, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of Butamin pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, they fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions, and they went their way. They also took Lot. So here they also, so they conquered. Sodom and Gomorrah were conquered. They were, they joined the battle and they lost the battle, and as they fled, they fell in these pits. Um, and, and so their, their enemies came and began to take all of the possessions as spoil for their victory. But they didn't just take possessions, they also took people. And they didn't just take people, they took God's man. They took Lot. Now, now as much as we read this story of Lot, we don't see a lot of spiritual anything from Lot, right? Uh, Lot, Lot is this guy who um, Scripture kind of tells us that this is this is one of God's people. Uh, God protects him. God goes after him. Mainly, you know, he's a he's a relative of Abram, and and um, and yet when you read his story, you don't see a lot of good that Lot ever does. Like he he earns nothing. He he just puts. He seems selfish. He puts himself in harm's way. And yet God has his number and God is going to protect him. And we're going to see that, that God calls him righteous, not because he was doing anything good, but simply because God says, you're mine. And, and so God protects him. Well, in this moment, these wicked kings rise up and they take him captive. Uh, and he is now a prisoner of these wicked kings. Uh, so they also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom, and his possessions and went their way. Notice that as well. Um, when Abram said, "Take, uh, go where you want to go. The land is 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 big, and we need to we need to separate from one another. You take you take what you want. I'll take what I want." Lot went towards Sodom, right? 
uh, he, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. He, he was still in the land that Abram uh, offered him. He was still in that land, but, but he was outside of Sodom in the beginning. But he didn't stay outside of Sodom. Now it says he was in Sodom. He was living in Sodom. Uh, this is often the case. When, when someone moves close to the border, they wind up moving into the border, into the city. They cross the border. They go into the city. What do I mean? In, in life, as, as you and I uh, wrestle and, and try, to, try to be godly people that live close to the borders that God has set, when we try to live close to the border, we will find ourselves crossing the border. Okay, when 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 there's a line and God says, I don't want you to, I don't want you to engage in these types of behaviors. I don't want you to go to these types of places. I don't want you to do this stuff. When when we try to get as close to that line as we can without crossing it, we will eventually find that we will move the line until we have moved into the city, until we have moved into Sodom. We will, we will see that I've seen that too many times. Um it it we're, we are best to not focus on uh, getting as close to Sodom as we can get to without moving into Sodom, but instead to get as close to Bethel or the house of God as we can. And we get as close as we can. We try to move into a place of, of spirituality and, and, and godliness. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I, don't, I do that well. So often, I feel like I'm the one who's just like trying to, trying to, how do you stay relevant? How do you stay cool? And so you're trying to just live your life on, on this side of the border without going into the, into the land of Sodom, without moving into the city. And yet what we find is we keep moving the borderline until all of a sudden we find ourselves in the city of Sodom. I hope that, that you guys are tracking with me. Uh, the, the victory of this is not just simply um, trying to stay out of Sodom and walking around the borders. But the victory, I believe, is trying to go into the house of God, is trying to be those that, that we're not even looking at the border. We're looking at God. We're, we're, we're seeking to follow him. We're seeking to worship him. We're seeking to be in his city and in his presence. We are considering ourselves to be citizens of his kingdom. And so we're not even concerned about what's going on in Sodom. But here's the thing. When we start looking and we get fascinated and drawn to the things that are happening in the wicked city, we will find ourselves becoming more and more like the people there. So and here's the thing, there's grace. We're gonna be the ones missing out. We're gonna be the ones overcome. We're gonna be the ones uh, being defeated by the enemies as, as was Lot. Uh, they also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions, and they went their way. Let's keep going. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the Oaks of Mamre, the Amorites, uh, the Oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and of Aner, and uh, these were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen, or Lot, had been taken captive, he led, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan, and he divided his forces against them by night. And he and his servants and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, Hoba, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. So Abram goes and rescues Lot. He goes after the kings. He, he fights against the enemies uh, and, he, and he brings them back and he saves them. And I love this. Uh, Abram... Abram's not a warrior. He's not a soldier. There's been no fighting up to this point, but he's got servants. He's got people uh, that, that, that walk with him, that, that he has authority over them. And these men are trained for battle and for whatever reason to protect themselves and to protect one another. None of them are family members. So here's the thing. Not a single one of them is Jewish. Not, not a single one. So where did these people come from? I don't know. Remember when he went to Egypt? 
when he went to Egypt for a while and, and he was blessed with all kinds of possessions and then he came back out of Egypt. Uh, but here's the thing. He, none of them are kids or are, are his kids. None of them are, are family members. They're just servants, people, you know, maybe employees. He started a company and, and he's got all these people who work for him because he's really, really rich. And so they, they're, they're, they're there to work for him. But then they go to battle with him and for him to rescue Lot. And that's his real, his own, the only reason why he's even involved in this battle is to rescue his nephew. And, and, and he does, and he goes and rescues them, but he also rescues uh, families. He, he says, look, look, uh, Lot and his possessions and the women and the people. So Abram, even though all of these wicked kings were defeated, Abram and his 318 guys go in and take out these kings and rescue all of the people, all of these people that are unjustly taken, all of these people, uh, he rescues the oppressed. And with 318 guys, God gives them favor. This is the thing that you see with Israel throughout scripture. God loves, I, I think he was probably hugely outnumbered here. God loves to show himself strong on behalf of his people when they stand up for righteousness, when they do the right thing, not just because they have the numbers, not just because they have the resources. Uh, remember the story of Gideon where, where God just kept boiling down the number and he wanted to take out the, the, uh, the Midianites by Gideon's hand, but they had, at first they had thousands, then they had hundreds, and he kept boiling the number down to the smallest, smallest number, and then God showed victory with the small number. God loves to do great things with small numbers. Um, maybe there's a cause that God's put on your heart, but you're like, I don't have the resources to make a dent. I tell you, walk in faith, stand up, do the work that God's called you to do. The resources are not what matters. You have him on your side, you can't lose. So uh, he, he rescues them. Now, I want to finish out this chapter if we can. We got like seven minutes, uh, and I want to finish this chapter because I, I feel like this next section is where it gets important and most significant. After his return from the defeat of Shadar Lamor and, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shav Shava. That is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, uh, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of the most high of God most high, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by the most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Uh, so so Abram comes back from the victory, and two kings come out to meet him. One is the king of Sodom. Remember, Sodom is the city that has has uh seduced Lot into moving in. Sodom is the city. It's the world. It's the opportunities. It's the, it's the hey, we have so much to offer you. You should come and, and we, let, let's, and you, you'll see what the, uh, here in a second, you'll see what the, they want to reward him. The, that, this is an amazing thing. Uh, it, when you have a spiritual victory, the world will seek to reward you. The world will seek to reward you. When you have a spiritual victory, the, the world will, will seek to give to you, will seek to bless you. Uh, you monetary gain, you, you, it'll be this, this subtle thing of you have done such a good job, let's make you rich from the world standpoint. Now, Abram has already been blessed by God by being obedient to God, but the world will seek to bless you. And, and what you will find so often, I'm, whatever, for whatever reason, um, Christian music comes to mind, and, and I know there, there, Christian music is all over the place. There's really godly people, and there's really ungodly people in the Christian music industry, but here's the thing. Uh, somebody is, is very successful and very fruitful in their ministry. Maybe it's a local church setting, and they're, and they're, they're, they're doing something just, just of the Lord, and there's a movement happening but then the world will come in because some businessman will look at this and, and say, hey, this is an opportunity for us to make a lot of money off of this person's movement and, and giftedness. And, and they will come in and, and they will see, hey, we want to bless you. We want to reward you for the work that you're doing. And what will happen is there will be a, some kind of a contract that will be signed. And then there will be compromises asked of that one that was following God previously. Now you have to follow the contract. And, and I just, for whatever reason, think Christian music. But I think there's a lot of ways that that works, that 
that, that you will find yourself in a position of victory in the Lord because you were obedient to the Lord. And then the world will begin to want to reward you, but that reward will come with consequences in the future. Um, so there are two kings. The king of Sodom is one, but then there's this other guy, Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is really interesting. He pops up throughout all of the scriptures, just at random times, thousands of years separated between them. This king of Salem, who is this? Some believe that this is Jesus himself. Uh, at the very least, he is a type of Jesus in the Old Testament, a Christophany. It's Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. Every once in a while, uh, he'll just pop in. And here, as, as Abram risks everything to go save Lot, and Abram knows, man, there's promise on his life. And so Abram knows God is going to stand with him, but he goes and he, and he rescues Lot, and Sodom is going to come, the king of Sodom, but also the king of Salem, which Salem means peace, the king of peace. Uh, now, Melchizedek is his name, which means king of righteousness. So king of righteousness, king of peace comes. And what does he do? He brings bread and wine. What is bread and wine? Bread and wine are the elements of communion, the, truly bread and wine. The night before Jesus was crucified, he sits down with his disciples and he has bread and wine and he breaks the bread and he says, this is my body broken for you. And he takes the cup after supper and he passes it around. Drink this in, in remembrance of me. This is the blood of the new covenant. Uh, whenever, and, and, and he talks about how Jesus says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, remember me. Remember me. Remember what I have done. What's amazing is Jesus didn't institute that for the first time on the Passover, but this was instituted before the Passover, right? So we know that, that, that when Jesus did it, he was celebrating the Passover that actually is going to come later in the book of Genesis. The Passover where death passed over uh, actually comes in uh, Exodus, doesn't it? Um, where death passes over the people of God who are protected by the blood on the doorpost. I hope some of you guys are following this. Uh, so he, he passes over and this institutes uh, the celebration of Passover where, where bread and wine are very much a part of this, uh, this, this celebration. But even before the Passover ever even happened and was ever even instituted, even before that, Melchizedek shows up to Abram as a celebration of the victory that he's just had, and he offers him bread and wine, the very same thing, a, a, a word of remembrance, but not remembering backwards, remembering forwards to a promise that is coming, just like what Jesus did. The Passover that he celebrated when he, when he broke the bread on the, on the, in the upper room with the disciples, it was not at that time in remembrance of something that had happened. It was in remembrance of something that was going to happen. And that happened far, far before, way back with Melchizedek here in Genesis chapter 14 where he brings these elements of communion to celebrate with Abram. Uh, so um, here he is, look at this, Melchizedek, which means king of righteousness. Uh, and he's from Salem, which is the city of peace, um, which is also what Jerusalem is called. Um, he's the king of Salem, the king of peace, king of righteousness. He's the priest of the most high God. Jesus himself is prophet, priest, and king. Uh, priest of the Most High God, and he blessed him, and he said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Uh, the victory that Abram had truly came by at the hand of God. The victory that you and I have comes at the hand of God. When we take the elements of communion, when we break the bread, when we drink the cup, we are remembering that our victory comes from the hand of the Most High God. It's so important that we understand that, that we remember that, that we don't come back from the victory with our 318 guys, with our tiny little church group, and we think, this is all about me, man. We're just really, really tough. That's how we took out all these kings. That's not, that's not what we do. Instead, we come back from our moment of victory, from your moment of victory. We come back from our moment of victory, and we drink the cup, and we eat the bread to remember 
that our victory came from the hands of the Most High God. We were outnumbered, we were weak, we should not have won, but he gave us victory. And so that's why we continue to take these elements to remember and reflect that our victory comes from the hand of God himself. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Notice this as well, tithing of the spoils that, that God has offered, tithing. Abram tithes, he gives to the Lord in worship a tenth of the increase of the, of the spoils of the victory that he has had. And this is before the law was given. It's before the law was given. This is uh, the, the, the pre-law and the post-law idea of giving is that we give to the Lord uh, in, in, in proportion to what he has given us as worship, not as regulation, not as God. It's not a God tax. Okay. It's not just taxes that are, that are from God's like, I want 10% of your money. That's not what it is. It's worship. It's, it's God. You deserve all of it. Uh, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to give the first fruits of what you've given me back to you for your purposes. And so he gives to this one, a 10th of everything. Um, a lot of people say, hey, tithing isn't for today because that's legalism. It's for the law. But just notice this is before the law was ever even given. Um, so the king of Sodom uh, and if so, verse 21, remember what I said about the world. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. He, I want to buy you off. You, you go ahead and keep the possessions, but I want the people. This is truly the enemy's tactic every time uh, to make the people of God um, compromise, you know, pay them off, the, let the people of God uh, sacrifice the people and take the possessions that we get consumed by the, the externals, by the material, and, and we neglect the people. God's heart is for the people, but so is the enemy's heart is to take down the people. Um, and so the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread uh, or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. Abram, Abram is saying, no, I will not compromise. Uh, I will not compromise. I will not allow the enemy. I will not allow Sodom to say that they made me rich. If I get rich, I get rich because God made me rich, not because Sodom made me rich. I will never give credit to the world for my victories. I will never give credit to the world for my abundance. Uh, but, but instead, I will only, I, he said, when he says, I've lifted my hands, he's made an oath uh, that he will only allow God to get the glory for all the riches that he has. And I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten. Okay, so they've already, the young men, they've been eating food, they've been feasting together. And the share of the men who went with me let Anner, Eskel, and Mamre take their share. So he's, he's allowing the, the men that fought with him, the leaders, the guys in his, in his crew, uh, let them take their share. You're not going to make me rich. I'm not going to compromise. You're not going to buy me out. I'm going to worship God. So Abram, man, he comes back from victory. He's offered even more. The greed in me and the greed in you may have been tempted to take more, but not Abram. Abram, instead of taking more, gives away 10% and then is offered as much possession as he wants uh, in exchange for, for releasing the people. And he says, no, I will not do it. You will not make me rich. I will not compromise. I will not obey you. I will not follow your lead. Uh, instead, I will continually worship God. This is the right heart, the right response. Um, I encourage you. Hopefully that spoke to you, challenged you. Uh, maybe you've made some connections about how you are going to live um, and how you're going to follow God and what, what you're going to do in response. Maybe you've made some connections of, oh man, what I thought might have been God trying to bless me. Maybe that was the world trying to buy me out. Um, make your decisions based on what the Lord would have you to do. You will find blessing in that. You will, you will lack nothing. I'm convinced of it. Let's pray together. Uh, and I got a lot to do today, Monday morning, jumping back in. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and pray. We'll close. I'll be back here at 7.30. We do 7.30 to 8 o'clock, Monday through Friday. Feel free to join us anytime. Lord, we thank you. 
uh, for your word. We thank you that we were able to get through these names, uh, make some sense of this message, this passage. We pray, God, that you would just continually drive us towards you, uh, continually um, open our minds, our eyes to what you're doing around us. Lord, we pray that we could hold loosely to the possessions, but we could be about the people that you put around us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Thanks for being on here. I will see you tomorrow at 730. Uh, we'll do this again. I try, I try to lock in a little bit early so that if you guys want to come on and be on right away, we can get started earlier. So around 725, you should be able to, if you come to this page, you should be able to find it, uh, maybe. So anyway, I'll see you tomorrow.